Welcome to Scripture's Four C's Insights. Insights into Sacred Scripture. And for this particular series, Insights into the Reflections on Humanity Vitae by Pope John Paul II. In the Wednesday addresses of Pope John Paul, he unfolded to the world again the renewed conviction of the heroic document of Pope Paul VI on Humanity Vitae, getting really down into the nitty-gritty of our faith and how to live it in the society of ours, which is calling us to be selfish, self-centered, and completely non-committal on what our Lord wants of us. We have with us today our theological director, Father John Harden, will be sharing his insights on Pope John Paul II's works in this most important document. And I think we ought to pray now before we start this series because this is probably one of the most controversial subjects of today and we need the grace of God to truly get us through this time. So let's pray. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Dear Heavenly Father, we come together in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, to read and reflect on Pope John Paul II's writings and his insights. We ask you, Father, to send the Holy Spirit down upon us and to truly give us that grace and that light to, to respond to your will, to realize that creation and man's participation in creation is the most important activity a human being can be involved in, in working with you and bringing other creatures into the world that will live for all eternity to love you and to serve you. And to help us to realize that our, we have an awesome responsibility in this age now to bring the truth into this dark world, the truth of the Holy Father, the Pope, reflecting the true teachings of the Church. We thank you, Father, for Pope John Paul II and what a gift he is to this Church. And we ask you now for the grace and the courage to do your will. All of this, again, in your Son's name, Jesus Christ. The Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Well, Father, in starting off just in the preface, uh, they, I guess Monsignor uh, Mol, you knew him, uh, world, and uh, he's talking about, in fact, the whole perspective of the new order and the new covenant of God the Son and human life is perfected and made divine. Now, what does he mean by that, made divine? Now, what... Monsignor world means and what our faith means is that because God came into the world, became man, and died on the cross for our salvation, the life of God which our first parents had lost mm -hmm. by original sin was restored to mankind. Mm -hmm. In other words, God need not have, but he did, elevate man to what we call the supernatural order, meaning that he destined man to possess God, to see God face to face, and as far as it is possible for a creature to be, to become divinized. Now, actually, uh, because of the fall, we're now given an opportunity to even... Uh, rise higher than we would have if there was no fall. Isn't that true? Yes. In other words, having fallen and having lost God's friendship, mm -hmm. then Christ coming and redeeming us because of the merits that Christ has gained for mankind, we can now rise to a higher state of perfection, draw closer to God, and be more happy and more intimate with him in heaven than we would ever have been had man not fallen and we might see as a consequence God not have become man in the person of Christ through his graces made possible by Christ. We are now able to become more holy than we would ever have been Otherwise, that's, that's a profound. That's I don't think ninety nine and ten percent of the Catholics. Well, this know is that. why. Mm -hmm. And again, we are speaking on Holy Saturday, right. That's right? In which the Church speaks of the Felix culpa, the happy fall, hmm. 
happy not because it was good that our first parents sinned, mm. but happy because the sin occasioned the coming of Christ, mm -hmm. who now raised us to a higher potential than we would ever have had possible had man not fallen. So therefore, in this really this life of, in, in, well, today we're just surrounded with sex. It's just saturating our society. And you said uh, something I never forgot in the canonization of Maria Goretti that uh, uh, Pope Paul or Pope Pius XII said something at that time about chastity. Yes. Back in 1950, the reigning pontiff, Pope Pius XII, when he canonized Maria Goretti, mm -hmm. declared, and he foretold, I see the church of the future in the next generation being persecuted and having to face especially mm -hmm. opposition from those who will use sex mm -hmm. to try to destroy the faith of the faithful. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what's happening. Because, you know, I guess like we said in our opening prayer, mm -hmm. the you know, as a couple, Gwen and I, entering into marriage and cooperating with God and bringing other people into the world that will last for all eternity. I mean, that is the, the highest function a human being can take place in, in, in cooperating with God in creation. Yes. And today we have just flaunted this whole gift and made it so cheap and have just destroyed this basic gift given to God. by. To and that is why we should not only strive to live up to the sometimes difficult teaching of the church, mm -hmm. but quite frankly, married life and married love, because of the challenges to marriage and marital love in today's society, right. marital love should be purer and more elevated than ever before. That's right. And in page three, Father, uh, the Holy Father talks about the, the language of the body uh, reread in truth. Now, what does he mean by that? Language of the truth. Mm -hmm. First of all, we know what it means to tell the truth. It means to externally manifest what is internally on the mind. Mm -hmm. When speech or language externally expressed, correspond to internal thought, then we speak the truth. Now, the language of the body about which the Holy Father is speaking is the language of marital intercourse. That the couple, married couple, in having intercourse, externally they are telling each other they love one another. Now, the key is whether what they are saying externally, what they are expressing by their physical embrace, corresponds to what they are thinking inside. There is such a thing as marital intercourse, being the bodily language, not of the truth, but of a lie. Right? Yeah, it's just done for pleasure and that's... Yes. Not helping In other words, the external expression of affection is, in the language of all nations, and in the literature of all peoples, is verbally, mm -hmm. using the body as a means of communication, says, in effect, I love you. Mm -hmm. Now, the secret, as the Holy Father says, the key is to make sure that what is externally expressed corresponds to what is internally believed. Mm -hmm. Do husband and wife really love one another when they engage in the marital embrace? If they do, 
then their body language is telling the truth. If, contrary to fact, they were externally saying with their bodies, I love you, she to him and he to him, her. If, as a matter of fact, they don't internally love, then the language which they are using is a telling a lie. Mm -hmm. That's what the Holy Father was after. Mm -hmm. It should be reread in truth. Now the rereading means he is telling people to re-examine. And of course he then proceeds to examine for them what authentic marital relations stand for. They stand for the authentic love of a husband for his wife and she for him. Well, Father, in Humanae Vitae, uh, the Holy Father is commenting on, why don't you just give us an, an overview on, on this papal encyclical? Well, Humanae Vitae was, we might say, long in coming. Mm -hmm. It was published on July 25th, 1968, which is almost three years after the Second Vatican Council closed. In the meantime, as you know, Pope John the Twenty-Third and Paul the Sixth had established a commission for looking into mm -hmm. the matter of contraception. Well, Humanae Vitae was published by Pope Paul the Sixth, not depending on the research and the findings of that commission but speaking as he expressed himself mm -hmm. with the authority of the figure of Christ and teaching what the church had taught from the very beginning. There are three parts to this famous and as you said very controverted right. encyclical. Part one is to identify the context in modern times. Mm -hmm when human life is being challenged on every side and the developments of modern science are raising questions never raised before. Mm -hmm. Part two, the Holy Father, Paul VI, lays down the doctrinal principles for marriage and for our purpose specifically for the morality of the marital act. Mm -hmm. The core of the encyclical is part two, doctrine. Then part three is the pastoral directives. In other words, what practical consequences follow, especially in terms of the people being educated and if need be re-educated mm -hmm. in the church's authentic teaching, the importance of developing the science, research especially, into ensuring that in our times the pressure on couples who would want to have children will not be such as to make it almost impossible for them mm -hmm. to rear a family in today's society. And then he closes with a plea that People will ask God for the grace they need to live up to the hard demands of humare vita. I know the Holy Father said when he was in the United States that we really shouldn't limit the children in the family only because of economic situations. To deprive the children of their brothers and sisters is a great injustice to those children. Yes, indeed. Themselves. He, however, recognizes the problems that are created by the modern economic situation, right. the political situation, and especially the lessening respect for human life. So that, as the Holy Father already then in 68 mm -hmm. predicted, and how truly prophetic his words were, 
In other words, unless, unless married people respect the marital relations that God wants them to practice, there is a great danger that from the practice of contraception they will come into the world the scourge of abortion. And this is exactly what's happened. How prophetic that mm -hmm. was. And then from this you start killing off the elderly then. So it, it follows a complete cycle in what we're seeing in this. So that in effect, although the immediate focal point of Humana Vitae was the Church's teaching on contraception, mm -hmm. in effect, this is on the sanctity of all human life. Mm -hmm. Unborn, born, aged, right. retarded, the unwanted. That's right. Now, the, and the contraception, is this prohibited at all times? What is the teaching? Yes. There? And the correct word, by the way, is contraception. Mm -hmm. From the two Latin words, contra, against, mm -hmm. and ceptio, or conceptio, which means conception. Mm -hmm. So contraception is the deliberate interference with the life process initiated by marital intercourse. Mm -hmm. And therefore, any deliberate, willful interference by whatever method, for example, sterilization is a form of contraception. Well, it's rampant today. It's just unbelievable. The intrauterine devices, the IUDs, mm -hmm. are forms of contraception. They are also, as you know, also abortifacients. Right. And uh, no matter what the motive is, the married couple may never directly interfere with the life process. Mm -hmm. God, in other words, has so created human nature that when man and woman engage us, they have the total right to do so in marital intercourse. Doing that, they must, by divine law, accept the consequences of their action mm -hmm. and may not inject their own wills to, on the one hand, enjoy the experience of intercourse, and on the other hand, prevent the consequences which would be or could be conception. Well, Father, some people say that this is not infallible teaching of the Church. That's that is absolutely, unqualifyingly false. Mm -hmm. Now, the terminology that is preferable in this context in fact, I would say in much of the Church's teaching, when we say that there is infallible teaching, such as, say, Our Lady's Assumption, mm -hmm. defined by Pope Pius XII, infallible. When we speak of infallible teaching, that refers to the one who is teaching. Mm -hmm. He, in this case, the Vicar of Christ, speaking as we say at cathedra, teaches infallibly. The language that is more specific in what we are talking about here is not to ask, though we may, mm -hmm. whether the teaching of the Church on humanae vitae or mm -hmm. on contraception is infallible. <clears throat> it is. But the sharper question is, is that doctrine irreversible? Yes. Right. Am I clear? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
In other words, the correlative to infallible is irreversible. Mm -hmm. Infallibility is in the one who teaches. Irreversibility is in the doctrine taught. Mm -hmm. And you just mm -hmm. put away all fuzziness when you ask, is the church's doctrine teaching that contraception, the deliberate interference with the life process, is that a mortal sin? Mm -hmm. And is that teaching of the church irreversible? The answer is yes. And this is really where the split is today. You know. Now, in order to clarify a very important issue, and I think as we begin these Reflections on Humanae Vitae, I think we should set the theological groundwork right. firmly. Don't you think so? Yes, right. There are two ways in which the Church teaches. The Church's teaching comes to us infallibly. Or what she teaches is irreversible doctrine. The one way is what we call the extraordinary magisterium. Mm -hmm. The extraordinary exercise of the church's supreme teaching authority. Mm -hmm. Such are ex cathedra pronouncements, like as we said, Pope Pius XII's definition of Mary's Assumption, mm -hmm. or a general ecumenical council like, say, the Council of Trent which defined, for example, that marriage is a sacrament and that marriage, sacramental marriage, consummated, is indissoluble. Mm. That we call the Church's extraordinary teaching authority mm -hmm. or magisterium. But much, indeed most of the Church's teaching is not done on just occasion or extraordinarily. The Church continues teaching and she better keep continue teaching constantly. That we call her ordinary universal magisterium. Mm -hmm. Why ordinary? Because it's the ordinary way that she teaches and universal because it is meant for the whole people of God. That teaching too, T double O, that teaching too is equally infallible and what is taught is equally irreversible. It is that kind mm -hmm. of irreversibility that the Church's teaching on the mortal sinfulness of contraception has been given to the people of God. So, because so many people are saying, well, the Church will eventually change. And Absolutely can't. never. Mm -hmm. Now, in order to fully develop this, we will need more time. Right. Let me just say that. Christ came into the world and founded the church in a contraceptive Mediterranean society. Mm -hmm. Contraception was widespread. In the first century already, to remove any illusions about the church's teaching, mm -hmm. ever changing, never will on this matter from the first century. Christians were identifiable as those who, unlike their pagan contemporaries, mm -hmm. did not practice contraception. Well, I think this is a beautiful theme to end this conference on, Father, because <clears throat> I think everybody has been talking about that, well, eventually the next pope will give in on this and uh, 
And we were talking about that Rome and the civilization of Rome was a kind of sept of society then. And, uh, so what's new? That's right. And I'm not sure whether the paganism of the Mediterranean was more pagan than ours today. Yeah, this is where we are. So we're going to break now for a half or for an hour, and you're going to receive your two books, The Reflections on Humanity by Pope John Paul II, and then the actual encyclical by Pope Paul VI on Humanity. And you're going to ha receive your daily readings of both these documents. And again, this is your opportunity to really find out where the action is, learn your faith, know what the Holy Fathers are teaching. And you will deepen your relationship when you're marital state. You'll develop a much deeper relationship with God when you finally really start to know why we're doing certain things. You may have been practicing a virtuous life all the way through, but to know the background for the church's teachings in this area is, is very important for us to grow spiritually. So we're asking you now to break for 60 minutes to receive your books, to outline and discuss what Father was talking about, and also share your insights of uh, what you've been reading and praying and meditating on in your interim meditation books that most of you should have now during this uh, two-week period when you have your Destiny in a Balance Cynical meeting and then you start a new piece of heart form. You all should be either reading The Imitation of Christ or My Daily Bread or Abandonment of Divine Providence or one of our own interim meditation books that will keep you, again, grounded in that spiritual life. We'll be back in 60 minutes. God bless.